Welcome to the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution and Civic Responsibility, an ongoing inquiry into the origins and evolution of American government. The Executive Director of the Virtual Center is Dr. Bill O'Brien. He's also the host of this discussion. And here he is, Dr. Bill O'Brien. Thank you, Agnes, and welcome to a Tuesday edition of the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution and Civic Responsibility. Today is the 24th day of January in the year 2017. It is a Tuesday, and because of that, as you know, we regularly begin our programs on Tuesday 30 minutes later uh, than, we, than we do on Mondays and Wednesdays. And while I mention Monday, let me, let me apologize uh, for not doing a live program yesterday. I was not feeling that well yesterday morning, and I kind of let our Agnes know in the middle of the morning that I really thought I ought to just just forego the program. And uh, uh, I just kind of took it easy and laid around during the day and feel much better, and everything's fine. So uh, anyway, um, I apologize for that, but I, I did uh, talk, to, uh, uh, talk to my brother last night, actually, and he said that he had listened to yesterday's program. It was a repeat. Um, and it was well, it was before the election, actually, and he found that encouraging. You know, it kind of made him remember uh, the world win. But uh, uh, Horst was on in the second hour of that particular program, and, and, and he thoroughly enjoyed it. And that's good. I'm glad. I'm, I'm, I'm glad. And Agnes had just told me that she picked that program for repeat because it was one of the, what she thought, one of the better programs. So I really do appreciate that, and I appreciate. Uh, all of you for staying uh, with us here at the Virtual Center and staying with the Head On Radio Network. And I, again, have to credit Bob and Agnes and the folks at Head On for, for, uh, for this program and for their importance in today's world. Our topic uh, today, obviously, is going to be the one that everybody's talking about, I think. There is so much going on that uh, I think the only profession that would be more lucrative, um, and, and I'm saying this, and it's only it's only four days since the inauguration. But already, I think the richest material available is for comedians. I I really do suspect that Stephen Colbert could go for the full hour and a half uh, with his monologue. That's how much there is. And in doing a program like this, I find the same thing. There is so much that um, it's almost overwhelming. I don't necessarily believe, uh, you know, as I've mentioned more than once before, I don't necessarily believe that that's totally an accident. I, I really believe that the that the flood of information and the flood of news is indeed very, very significant. We'll get into that a little bit uh, in today's program. Let me first of all share with you once again our phone number, and uh, I do encourage you to feel free to pick up the phone, and when I say feel free, I don't mean that as an opportunity necessarily. I mean it literally as encouragement. I do encourage you to avail yourself of the opportunity to share your thoughts and your ideas with our other listeners, because I think given the kinds of things that's going on, it's very, very important that we talk, that we communicate, and that we keep doing so. And so I think that our phone number is becoming more important than ever. If you'd like to get on the air, the phone number is area code 304-663-4676. That's 304-663-4676. My email address, if you'd like to communicate with me via email, is waobrien906 at gmail.com. That's waobrien, O-B-R-I-E-N, 906 at gmail.com. And finally, I do call your attention to our Facebook page, and I've tried to remain fairly active on Facebook and sharing links with particular articles and, and, and offering some commentary on them. And a few of those uh, is what I think is going to be the substance of the program today. But if you are a user of Facebook, you know uh, basically that it's very simple. Just go to the homepage, facebook.com, 
And in the search box at the top, just type in the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution, and you will be into our Facebook page. And there are a number of links and a number of articles. I was talking to a good friend last night on the telephone, whom I, I haven't heard from her for quite a while. And she was making the comment that she was spending the evening reading some of the links that I had put on the Virtual Center uh, Facebook page. And that, that I found that encouraging. <laughs> and uh, there are a lot of them. There, there, I've probably put six or seven on there over the last uh, three days, three or four days. So um, began, obviously, after the inauguration on Friday and the uh, Sean Spicer press conference on Saturday evening after President Trump came back from the uh, the CIA visit uh, in the midst of the protests in Washington and other places around the city or around the country, around the world. And uh, it's just been kind of escalating from there. Uh, there's so much. As you know, um, Mr. Spicer held another regular press conference yesterday, and obviously it's it's understandable his performance was received a lot more kudos and a lot better results than his Saturday one. We'll we'll talk about that in a little bit, and um, and then from what I understand, there's another one today. I also understand, and I haven't been um, in preparing for today's program. I haven't been. Uh, able to check recently, but as of this morning, there was an announcement that um, the president was prepared at 11 a.m. to to sign an executive order or sign an order um, which basically would restore the uh, the pipeline, the Keystone, and um, and, and we're continuing to move forward. There was also a meeting this morning uh, of auto, the auto uh, executives. Uh, uh, and f according to uh, the prelude to that meeting, the, the, the argument was or the suggestion was that the president was meeting with these folks in order to discuss uh, ways to increase production in this country and minimize or limit or actually reverse uh, the inclination of automobile companies to move their operations out of the country and in order to try to create more jobs for Americans. And, and of course, it, you know, we, we know that uh, yesterday the president signed the order which pretty much trashed the permanently the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And, of course, that met very positive reactions from Bernie Sanders and and um, uh, le leading Democrats and labor leaders and and all the rest of it. Um, but at the same time, it didn't meet with uh, support from Republican leaders. So, again, I just think there's so much going on and it's happened fast. And he, he promised that he said that that, you know, that once this thing took off, he was basically going to roll up his sleeves and get to work. And he's done that. And he's putting in uh, pretty extensive days uh, so far. And, uh, and the, the course, the news media is all over it. I mean, it's, it's the, the, the news opportunities are legion. There's absolutely no question. And again, it's, it's very, very difficult. It's becoming very difficult to sift through the amount of news that's coming out. Um, and so I, I think all of that is significant. One thing that I wanted to mention at the, at the beginning today, when I, when I was sharing with you the, my email address and then the Facebook page address, one of the things I've noticed, and I think this is pretty much uh, the direction that technology is moving in, I've noticed a substantial drop in the use of email. And I see it being replaced by more extensive use of Facebook. I find, uh, in my own case, personally, without even thinking about it, that I find it much easier to go to Facebook and message people that I want to communicate with one-on-one -on, -one on Facebook than it is to send them an email. And one of the reasons I've been finding that more, um, more, more attractive is that I, ha I know 
that the people I'm communicating with in large part spend much more time on Facebook than they do on email. Sometimes I'll send an email and I won't get a response for a day or two. But if I message them on Facebook, I usually get a response in an hour or two. And I think that says a lot about the nature of the of the animal itself, the, what's happening with technology. I'm obviously not uh, – I you know, really thought that I had um, – walk into the inner, the inner kingdom, if you will, when I basically became comfortable with Facebook, with uh, email. And I'm beginning to think that the, that that particular uh, medium is moving further. And the, and of course my, my problem is I don't move that fast with it. So, uh, but I'm, I'm going to have to, because I can find myself sliding uh, ever more slowly uh, into the change myself. And I, I, Hadn't really noticed it or even thought about it until this morning. And uh, I go, when I go on, uh, you know, sit down at the computer in the morning, uh, I find myself going to Facebook first. And there are oftentimes messages there. And so sometimes it'll be a while before I even look at my email account. And that never used to be. That used to be the first place that I went every every day. So... So I've seen that old that old that that change, you know, myself, and I'm kind of guessing that it could be uh, something that's becoming even more, even more pre prevalent. I was trying to figure out a way to to deal with the variety, the de the breadth of material coming out. The issue that, that I really wanted to address yesterday, and of course it's still there today, and it will be for a while, I think it's, it's that important an issue, was the appearance on Meet the Press on Sunday of, Con, of, of Kellyanne Conway, and the issue that came up over the term alternative facts. It's received a lot of attention and a lot of coverage. And I wanted to focus a bit on that because, in effect, last week during these programs, we pretty much laid the groundwork for that, for that particular program, for that particular portion of the Meet the Press program, uh, when we were talking about the kinds of fake news or post-truth or disinformation or out and out untruths or lies that seem to be becoming more and more a prominent feature of what was coming out of Washington in the last weeks, days, not only days, but, but weeks as well. And if you'll recall, and it's almost impossible to to address this issue without going back to the program we did last week. I believe it was last week. On the issue of Compromat, if you remember, we did a program. This was a this was an article that appeared on the 15th of January, so it was like nine days ago, and we dealt with it last week in one of our programs last week, and it deals with the issue of a word that is, has its origins in Russian called Kompromat. And I had put an item on Facebook, a posting on Facebook, addressing this particular issue with a link to the article. The author of the article was Amanda Taub, T-A-U-B. It, it appeared in the New York Times on the 15th of January. And basically, she was talking about the emergence and the increased usage of a term that originated in Russia called Kompromat. 
And she said its origins are Russian for the words compromising and information. So it suggests that the word compromise is a form of compromise on information. In other words, something less than truth. And that seems to be what we're basically talking about. The paragraph that I excerpted from this particular article that I thought was one of the most relevant was the following. And this is Amanda Taub. In fact, she said, Compromat is more than an individual piece of damaging information. It's more than disinformation. Sometimes it's really not information at all. Or at least it's the result of an environment or an atmosphere in which people have lost the ability to distinguish information from non-information from untruth or disinformation. What it has done is confuse populations to the point that people really don't know what they're reading and what they're hearing. It could be information, but maybe it isn't. It appears to be fact, but in fact it may not be fact at all. And so the general conclusion is, since I don't know, and I can't be sure, maybe the best thing that I can do is kind of prepare myself for the fact that what I think I'm seeing or hearing, I'm not really hearing or seeing it at all. And what that means is that I become more and more convinced that there's no way to determine the accuracy of anything anymore. It's all kind of a moving target. What appears to be fact is really not fact at all. It's somebody's opinion. And chances are those that aren't agreeing with it are going to come up with an alternative opinion. And basically, it's going to end up being whichever one of those opinions I feel most comfortable with those are the ones that I'm probably going to support. This is what Amber, uh, Amber Traub, Amanda Tau, brother, says about the word compromise. She says it is more than an individual piece of damaging information. It is a broader attempt to manufacture public cynicism and confusion in ways that target not just one individual, but an entire society. So the goal is not the information. The goal is to confuse people by presenting that information, if it's information. Maybe it's, maybe it's fake news. Maybe it's not true at all. But the goal is not to communicate information at all. The goal is to communicate in a way which confuses and frustrates for a purpose. By eroding the very idea of a shared reality and by spreading apathy and confusion among a public that learns to distrust its leaders and its institutions alike, compromise undermines a society's ability to hold the, po the, po the powerful to account and ensures the proper functioning of government, unquote. So the purpose here is to make the release of information, to turn communication into a vehicle to frustrate and confuse the public to the point that they give up trying to hold you accountable for what you say. In effect, what we're talking about here is using interpretation or communication as a way to separate oneself from being accountable. It's turning communication 
into a weapon of power. A way to keep power and to have that power unchallenged. Because what you've done is so discombobulated the general population that they really don't have any idea what's true anymore. In fact, they begin to doubt whether anything's true anymore. And what that means is they become ripe to believe nothing but what you tell them. That's the ultimate goal of the, auto of the autocrat. That's really the intent of this whole process. The intentional confusion of an entire society to the point that cynicism reigns supreme. Cynicism becomes common. It becomes the predominant feeling among the general population. <coughs> People don't seem to believe anything anymore. They found that they can't trust anybody about anything. So consequently, why the hell worry about it? Most people don't worry either. The result is that those in power are un stay untouched by scandal. Nothing ever reaches them. Those to whom they are most accountable have stopped holding them accountable. In effect, government becomes accountable to nobody. This is the idea of compromise. What we've seen this past weekend in Washington our classic, classic examples of compromise in operation. Like most of you, I watched the inauguration. I listened to the inaugural address, if you can, if you can call it that, and I, uh, you know. I've, I've read a number of reactions to it, and not many of them are very favorable. Some are. But the fact of the matter is, most of them are very suspicious, very suspicious and very um, uncertain and disappointed, if you will. George Will called it one of the, one, you know, one of the worst inaugural address ever delivered. The Wall Street Journal reports that portions of it were written by Stephen Bannon. And he's on the President Trump's staff now. And he was the executive director of, of the, you know, he, he is a member of the alt-right and a, he was, was director of Breitbart News before he was asked by Donald Trump to join his, his campaign. And then ultimately his White House. And that's really bothered a lot of people. But what bothers most peop more people even more than that is the direct appeal to the people. The degree to which the inaugural address was the term that is most frequently used is populist. Government's direct, uh, direct appeal to the people. And what basically is happening is exactly what the idea of compromise suggests can and usually does happen when this kind of a situation exists. That government begins to go directly to the general public, bypassing all the checks, all the balances, all the intervening institutions. We predicted this here in our conversations here at the Virtual Center when we were talking about the use of Twitter and the president's realization of the ability to instantaneously communicate with huge proportions of the general public, those on his Twitter account.
We predicted that the potential of this direct communication from the president to the general public was unheralded. And it raised serious questions about the future and the stability of the republic. Because in a sense, it gave the president the opportunity to, de- to, uh, to reach and appeal directly to the people. Not to have to worry about Congress, not to have to worry about the Senate, not to have to worry about the court, but to immediately bring to bear the power of millions of millions of people on the agencies of government in order to support or to not support particular policies and particular pieces of legislation. It is the very essence of a total change in approach to government. It's more than the desire to confuse. This becomes the desire to control. In essence, then, this is not what we call populism in today's world with social media and the avenue of instantaneous technology available. This becomes a brand or a degree of populism that the world really hasn't had the opportunity to experience before. Traditionally, history tells us that populism in the past was efforts of government or factions, organized factions, to appeal directly to the people and to fashion themselves as spokesmen for the interests of the people. In other words, building political movements in order to bring the pressure of of popular power on the agencies of government in order to get favorable legislation or to defeat unfavorable legislation. That's what populism traditionally was. And what history tells us is that more often than not, populist movements tended to be the toys of demagogues. Populism became the favorite tool, the favorite strategy of demagogues whose goal was personal power and whose preferred way to get it was being able to convince the general public that I am the one who can best represent your interests. Or to quote the current president, I am your voice. In order for this to be successful, you need to lay the groundwork with something like what we've called compromise. Basically, getting people confused and frustrated because they don't know what to believe, they don't know what they can believe. So the only alternative left for them is to determine who they will believe. And once you get to that point, you've got it. It seems to me that that probably defines the nature of the inaugural address about as good best as good a way as i've been able to explain it or to envision it or see it it's a direct appeal to the people clearly it doesn't say much for the institutions of government that are there to to stop and check and refine and all these other things Uh, that we look for. If you remember, when we talked about this some time ago, we were talking about it in terms of a second convention. And it was my strong feeling 
that with this kind of thing happening, with this kind of direct access to the general public happening, and the kind of division and divisiveness that we're seeing in our political world within our own country here in terms of politics, this doesn't seem to me the right time to put the Constitution of the United States on the table for, re for revision. Even more recent than that, it, this was around the election, it didn't seem time to move forward with efforts to abolish the Electoral College. Because the Electoral College, while it isn't really much of an impediment, is an impediment. It's a check that the founders put in there, in the Constitution, in order to slow down the process by denying vast numbers of uninformed people the opportunity to directly choose the President of the United States. And so, ironically, as aware as I am of the results of the November 8th election, the reality that the losing candidate, Hillary Clinton, out, outdrew Donald Trump by better than 2.8 million popular votes. And the fact that there has been sentiment for a long time to overturn or undo or emasculate the Electoral College, under these circumstances that we find ourselves in now, it didn't seem to me to be the, mess, the best thing that we could do right now. It wouldn't affect the election that just happened. And it seems to me if something in the area of the Electoral College does need to happen, we probably have a little time to do it because we theoretically at least have four years left until the next time it might come into play. On Meet the Press Sunday, in an exchange between Kellyanne Conway, Con, Kelly Conway and Chuck Todd, the issue of untruths, falsehoods, coming out of the White House over the weekend was the issue on the table, going back to something that everybody knows, the inauguration was Friday, the balls, the inaugural balls were Friday night, the women's march was Saturday and went on all day Saturday on many of the, mo most of the networks. President Trump, on his first day in office, made his first visit to CIA headquarters. And of course, there's been a lot of conversation and a lot of debate about that particular visit. Most people believe that the purpose of the visit was to smooth relations between the intelligence, the intelligence community and Donald Trump. Because in recent days, Donald Trump had gone to great lengths to criticize the intelligence community and to suggest that the intelligence community was in favor of a victory by Hillary Clinton, that the intelligence community's focus on Russian involvement in the election was in an effort to basically demonstrate that Russian influence had been in part at least responsible for his victory and his response to that is to deny it and to suggest that millions of undocumented, undocumented aliens who voted for Hillary Clinton was really what cost him the popular vote. So in other words, he's arguing that the popular vote is not legitimate. 
it was the Electoral College that got him elected. And then, of course, came the issue of the attendance at the inaugural. And the National Park Service put out a photograph of the turnout at the Trump inaugural and compared it with a photograph of Barack Obama's first inaugural in January of 2009. And the photograph clearly indicated that there was a substantial difference that in spite of the fact that President Trump was claiming, and this is what he claimed at CIA headquarters in his, in his talk there with the, with the intelligence community, he claimed that as he spoke, he was looking out on what must have been a million to a million and a half people. The photograph said otherwise. And then the White House came up with a no number of reasons or excuses for those two photographs. The National Park Service right or ability to even pu put out those kinds of photographs was taken away. The Twitter rights of the National Park Service were taken away. And when President Trump went to the CIA on Saturday, he basically spent most of his time talking about his inaugural and the huge crowds and the fact that the media was out to get him and was attacking him and that it was the media that had created the discord between him and the intelligence community. He pledged his support 100% for the intelligence community and said that any idea or any sense that he had an in for the intelligence community was really part of what he called fake news. It was a fabrication of the media. And then that evening, after he got back to the White House, and I call your attention to an article on in today's Washington Post. If you go to the website, it's on the front page. It's kind of inside stuff on the kinds of things that were going on inside the White House. And the conflicts within the White House staff over some of these things. Apparently, when the president returned to the White House from Langley, from CIA headquarters, he turned on the television and everywhere saw the great turnout of protest movements, not only around this country, but around the world. The estimates were that as many as 500,000 people in this country and a worldwide more than a million. And the reports in the piece in this morning's Washington Post suggest that the president became angrier and angrier and more frustrated and more hostile to the media to the point that he turned to his new press secretary, Sean Spicer, told him to get out there and talk to the media and give them a piece of his mind. And Sean Spicer did. At 4 p.m. on Saturday afternoon, there was a called press conference, but it really wasn't a press conference at all. It was Sean Spicer reading from a written script, chastising the media for taking every avenue in the world in order to make the president and his new administration look bad. And in the course of the presentation about the turnout at the inaugural, Sean Spicer basically put out one after the other piece of information that was clearly demonstrated to be untrue. There were a series of untruths. 
And then a lot of the attention went to Spice's approach. The fact that he, this was his first time appearing before the press. It was unprepared. He wasn't ready. The word in the article this morning suggests that he was in the process of moving into his new office, of unpacking boxes. He was disheveled. He was nervous. He was upset. And he was paraded out there in front of the press to read them the riot act. This was his first communication with the media official. And it didn't go well. He had a second appearance before the media yesterday in a scheduled press conference. That one went much, much better. He was not disheveled. He was prepared. He seemed less nervous. He seemed comfortable and prepared. He had facts and he did what he was supposed to do. The reports were that Donald Trump was very unhappy with his presentation on Saturday but elated with his presentation yesterday. And in spite of the fact that most of the reports about the Saturday presentation at the press conference suggested or talked about how hard Sean Spicer was coming down on the media, the fact of the matter is the reports were that President Trump didn't think he was hard enough on the media. He took no questions. He just basically closed his statement and left the room. And then Sunday morning, Kellyanne Conway appeared on a number of networks. She was on Fox, but she also appeared on Meet the Press. And Chuck Todd asked her directly about Sean Spicer's appearance on Saturday, late Saturday afternoon. And the question he asked, which was a good one. Why would the president or why would the administration allow Sean Spicer in his first experience as press secretary with the media come out there and report untruths? And Kellyanne Conway took issue with the words untruth and called the information that Sean Spicer had delivered alternative facts. And Chuck Todd called her on it and said, facts, these aren't facts. There's no such thing as, un as alternative facts. There are facts and there are untruths. Reports are that there's a lot of consternation within certain groups within the White House about the president's unwillingness to drop these issues and to continue to focus on his inaugural, on the turnout of his inaugural, on the degree of his support, and on the media, and that he needs to really spend more time and give more attention to the issues of policy. There are others, however, that believe that what he's doing is the right thing to be doing. And that's kind of where we are. Alternative facts. Compromat. Untruths. Disinformation. Facts that aren't facts. Facts that appear to be facts, but may not be facts. Four days into the new administration, we're engaged deeply in issues related to First Amendment issues of, you know, of freedom of the press, the role of the press to hold the administration accountable, the extent to which we obviously have a person in the White House whose fascination and, and, and focus of attention is predominantly on himself and on his image. And we're looking at four days short of four years 
theoretically, where a lot of people believe that it could only get worse. One of the things that occurred yesterday Sean Spicer's news conference yesterday, the good one, the positive one, made it clear that the president had done a number of official things yesterday in his first Monday, working Monday in office. And, of course, the big one was signing the executive order to trash the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Then another one was to remove federal funding from anything in, associated with foreign aid that went toward abortions anywhere in the world, any, anywhere, anywhere in the world. But one of the other things that the president did yesterday that I don't think got as much attention as perhaps it ought to have, was his declaration that his inaugural day, January 20th, 2017, was to be a national day of patriotic devotion. And it referred to his mention in the inaugural address on Friday about the issue of patriotism. And the line in his inaugural said, when you open your heart to patriotism, there's no room for prejudice. That's a quote. I think it's worth a, t a moment to think about that statement. When you open your heart to patriotism, there's no room for prejudice. Charles Blow, B-L-O-W, Charles Blau, in the New York Times on Monday, yesterday, made reference to that particular statement and took issue with it, as did I, and points out, that sometimes patriotism can enshrine prejudice. I think I have Blau's, I think I have Ch Charles Blau's article here in which he talks about that. When you open your heart to, pre to patriotism, there is no room for, pa for prejudice. Charles Blau says, patriotism does not drive out prejudice. To the contrary, it can actually enshrine it. No one was more patriotic than our founding fathers, yet most of the prominent founders were slave owners. And then Blau goes on and talks about protest. Language is really an important issue here. And it's becoming more so as we go. The choice of words. Going back to the Meet the Press conference for a minute yesterday with Kellyanne Conway and Chuck Todd. Chuck Todd continually used the word untrue, uh, uh, falsehoods. He did not say lies. He said falsehoods. There's a difference, an important difference. Falsehoods mean information that is not true. Lies imply an intent to be untruthful. 
There's an intent associated with it. Chuck Todd, Chuck Todd never went there. Some commentators, the most critical ones, believe that he should have. But the fact of the matter is he didn't. It's one thing to say that the information being presented was not factual. It's another thing to say that those delivering the information knew it wasn't factual and intentionally delivered it in order to try to convince people that it was factual. In today's world, I can't imagine that it's going to be long before we move from falsehoods to lies. That seems to be the kind of relationship that is emerging here. Let me make one more comment before it slips my mind totally. about this particular issue of untruths and lies. Actually, that did slip my mind. And <laughs> before it slips my mind, and it was slipping as I said that. So I apologize for it. I know it will, it will come back. I made a comment to some friends last evening about the kinds of things that are going on and the the issue of untruths or alternative facts or or uh, disinformation or fake news or post truth or all of these words all this language you know these terms are being thrown around now but it seems to me what we've looked at so far in today's program and we're moving kind of along it's 20 minutes after the hour so we've got about 35 40 minutes to go it's becoming very clear that something is happening. And I don't think we can afford to let it happen without knowing that it's happening. Because what I'm talking about, and I made reference to this earlier, is the bigger picture here. And the bigger picture here is pretty much contained in the transition from Compromat to the inaugural to the idea of alternative facts. and the idea of direct communication with the people. And that's why it's important to understand, especially the relationship between them. Let me be a little bit more specific, because I think this is really the most important point of all of this. Social media, technology, gives creates the opportunity to directly access millions of people in the general public. And President Trump was aware of that during the campaign. He said that. If you remember the interview we had with Leslie Stahl on CBS News. <coughs> he made the point that social media is what got him elected this ability to directly communicate with his constituency. And he had no intention of, of dropping it or stopping it after he was inaugurated. And now it's becoming more clear than ever that he has no intention to do that, to do that. And he made mention in one of his comments, and I believe it was at the CIA. I watched that on uh, live on television. I think it was at, at the session Saturday at the CIA. I think he made the point that his Twitter account gives him access to 20 million people, citizens, immediate, in, immediate access to 20 million citizens. And this was the point of his inaugural, 
that this means that he, as president, is in a position where he can do something for these people. And by staying in constant communication with them, they tell him what they want and he does it. At least that's the implication that he's giving. In effect, what it does is render inoperative the institutional checks on the power of the president, on the development and design of policy or anything else. In order for all of this to work, this idea of frustration and confusion has to be there. The disinformation has to happen first. People have to be unsure. They have to reach the point where they don't know what to believe and what not to believe. Once they become convinced that they don't know what to believe and what not to believe, and they don't have any way of finding out one from the other, then the only alternative left is to trust the source. That has to happen before something like alternative facts And Sean Spicer in in Monday's news conference made mention of the same thing. He didn't use the term alternative facts. He taught them. He talked about different different facts. The point is, fact is fact, and the message sent is pretty much determined by what the people hear. And that's what we have to keep in mind. I think this is absolutely incredibly important. It is so important for everything, not only that is happening, but everything that in the near future might happen. Because this kind of disinformation or this kind of uncertainty and frustration and anger and confusion on the part of the general public makes that general public very vulnerable to government. And if that's really what all of this is about, and social media provides the access, the mechanism for access, then we've got the makings here of something very, very significant. And I think we all need to appreciate that. There's one more thing to comment on here, and this is the thing that slipped my mind a few moments ago, and it just came back. I hope I can keep it there long enough to share it with you. This is the obvious point. I think most of us know this. All of this issue of (coughs) of the size of the crowds at the inaugural. The issue of whether the media is out to get the president out to this to 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 um, to alienate the president out to reinforce John Lewis's claim that this president and this administration is not really legitimate. This conversation, all of it, accomplishes other things. One of the things that it accomplished this weekend is related to the huge protests around the country and around the world on Saturday. These were the largest protests ever in this country. It received a lot of media attention while it was going on. But the fact of the matter is all of this flap between the president and the media over photographs of the inaugural of the mall 
and the size of the crowd and the issue of alternative facts and all the rest of it pretty much took Saturday's protests off the front pages of our newspapers. There's no question that under normal circumstances, if we could even define what they might be, protests that large, turnouts that big, where literally the intended or proposed march had to be canceled because the crowd was so thick there was no way to move, for people to move, to march anywhere. That kind of public turnout, a public display, would be big news. But it wasn't this weekend. The administration was successful in taking that off the front pages. As one person put it, the result was that the largest protest in American history, clearly the largest anti-inauguration protest in the nation's history, came one day and was gone the next. It received a lot of coverage while it was going on, but it received none after the Sunday morning talk shows because the administration successfully took back control of the news. by some of the outlandish statements related to populations and turnout and all the rest of them. Once again, the president reiterated that there were three to five million undocumented votes for Hillary Clinton, which cost him the, the, the popular vote on November 8th. There's no evidence to support that. In fact, the implication that anything like that happened would raise serious questions about the integrity of our entire electoral process. It would mean that the concern over Russian hacking, Russian interference in our elections, would not be the biggest threat. The biggest threat would be that the very electoral process itself is so fundamentally flawed that it can't be trusted. In that kind of a context, the Russian involvement would become secondary. So in effect, the president was able to successfully do what he did throughout his entire campaign. He was able to take control of the news and manipulate it to his own advantage. And we might say, well, how is so much criticism of him and allegations of untruth and disinformation and all of that, how is this an advantage to him? It becomes an advantage if it takes away public attention from other news that would be the big story of the weekend, which would be the size of that protest and the significance of that protest. If you look in the, at the awesome power of the turnout of that protest against the inaugural, against the election of Donald Trump, in the context of the fact that close to three million more voters voted for Hillary Clinton than Donald Trump, if you looked at those pieces of information and put them together, you would have the makings of a public opinion disaster for the administration. 
the administration made certain that that would not happen. So consequently, one of the largest protests in the history of this nation came one day and it was gone the next. Kellyanne Conway and Sean Spicer were successful in making the issue of the day the personality of the president, the idiosyncrasies of the president, the vindictiveness of the president, the positive aspects of some of the things the president is doing, in other words, all the things that one could normally expect to happen in a new administration have been the focus of the news. And the impact of the protests is gone. Bill, could I jump in there for a minute? Sure. And I'd like to thank Katie Birch for carrying my name in the Women's March. I really do appreciate it. I was, oh. I was here working with social media. But... Here's what it accomplished. Women's rights didn't matter before the march. They made them go away in a day. That's the message that they're sending to us. Mm -hmm. This is gaslighting the American people. And it's causing turmoil in the, the smaller sex, brother against brother. We're, we're looking at a civil war. Mm -hmm. And... Isn't this how a monarchy starts? Well, this is this is what causes people to look for for that. Yeah, this is I mean, it's this kind of circumstance that so frustrates people that they look to a strong force, a strong power. They're looking for somebody who seems to bring promise that they can fix all this and make it better. And this president has promised that he can do that. Well, if you watch the inauguration as the, the gentlemen are coming out, Paul Ryan is smiling like a cat that's ate the bird the entire time. Right. And watch how he responds to Donald Trump. You know, Bob told me, he said, no, Trump despises Ryan. And I said, well, he doesn't right now because Ryan's sitting in the catbird seat. You can see it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what does that tell us? Uh, you know, I, I think uh, there's a lot of suspicion that many of the things that that Trump is doing. I mean, one of the things is the is the trade the uh, Pacific uh, Partnership uh, termination. Yeah, that that's something that Ryan supports and that M Mitch McConnell supports. They're big free traders and free in, in, big internationalists. And Donald Trump, in terms of relations with the rest of the world is taking the country in a different direction. I mean, he basically handed the Pacific, the economy of the entire Pacific trade region to China Yeah. this weekend. I mean, that's essentially what he did. At the same time, he's waving the finger at China about the, about the, the South China Sea and basically saying, we will make sure that China does not have access to the islands that they created in the South China Sea because that's international waters. And somebody made the comment in the, this morning that, in effect, what he's talking about, the only way that he could stop China would be some sort of a blockade. A war. And a blockade is a declaration of war, yes. Exactly, and that's where we're going. That's frightening. And the question is, does the president realize this? Or if he doesn't, or he's not sure, and I mean, this is really pretty involved, then you gotta be, you've got to depend on the people that are with you to point these things out if you're going to make wise policy. The problem is that there's so much bickering and backbiting going on within the administration itself, that people seem to be sucking up to the president to the point that nobody's willing to stand up against him. And Paul Ryan, at this point, could be the classic example of that. 
exactly. He hasn't he hasn't shown any indication of a willingness to take issue with Trump at all. He didn't even take issue with that horrendous tape that came out that Trump, you know, that was released with Trump's co comments about women. I mean, he, he didn't withdraw his support for Trump's nomination, even with that. Yeah. I mean, what these guys are saying is it's so important that we win this election that we can uh, we can overlook almost anything. Exactly. Oh, man, this and is so scary. And when you look at it, Donald Trump is not a fighter. He has no military experience. He's into corporate takeovers at best. Right. He is an image. That's it. But the last war we had under Bush made a lot of people a lot of money that yep. was centered there in D.C. This is the same swamp that we were talking about, and they didn't drain it. They added to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so yeah. now, the last time, there, there were allegations and insinuations of even people in the government being, um, being told, you know, we'll make you go away. Remember, right. wasn't it uh, Rockefeller that hid his uh, vote or something in the – I can't remember who it was. Someone actually hid their vote. Mm -hmm. In case something would happen, and I think it was Rockefeller. Yeah. But when you look that our government's afraid of the government setting, what does that say? Yeah. That this is what bothers me is 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 that there's nobody that I've that I've seen none of these people that are willing to to take the president on. I mean, it was obvious that this. This thing Saturday night with Sean Spicer coming out and making a fool of himself um, was an embarrassment. Which he knew. <laughs> and, 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 and he knew, and there had to be – I mean that's why he was so uncomfortable. And there had to be people in the White House that knew, but nobody would say anything. They just backed off because the president was upset. He was angry, and he was frustrated, and he was determined that something happened. He's a child. But, you know, in that sense, yes. And but there is this other possibility, and that is that all of this was designed to take the focus away from the Women's March with all those Sunday programs coming up on Sunday morning. I think that, I, you know, I mean, it's possible that his concern was if we don't find a way to rest the to rest the focus of the news away from those protests. Because they were embarrassed. I mean, it was unbelievable. Donald Trump went all the way to the CIA on Saturday in the same city where the protest was happening and never mentioned it. Exactly. Never mentioned it was going on. And for, could, reports this morning say, and of course, all of these are unnamed sources because nobody's willing to put their name beside anything yeah. anymore. But what they're all saying is it was when he came back from Langley, back from the CIA meeting to the White House and turned on the television that he started to get angrier and angrier and angrier because obviously – there's a message being given out there by millions of people, you know, uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of people in the streets. And and uh, and and so that 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 could could conceivably have been behind this. And if that's true, that's scary. Well, think of the coup that he performed. He managed to make the march. A non sequitur in yeah, one I'm, day. Uh, the new I'm, Yeah. Yeah. And the media and the whole, was behind him. The whole message, as you say, the whole message of women's rights. I mean, this was a protest against what he said about women. Yeah. It, it, actually, it's a human rights. I mean, every, he, everybody's exactly, included. It is. And he, and he basically was able to blunt that. Exactly. And, and, and that really bothers me about the media also. Because I think the media is doing exactly what they did during the campaign. And that is, I mean, what what Hillary Clinton and the Democrats are being criticized for, and that is they're focusing more attention on him than they are on his policies and what he stands for and what he'll do. And I mean, that's really it's what he does or doesn't do that really is going to affect people. But what they're doing is pointing out that you know that he's that he's a child, that he has an uncontrollable temper, that he he has a a desire or need to get even 
that yeah. he, he, he basically makes sure that if anybody ever crosses him, he gets even. It, there is no way that anyone can tell me a doctor tested him and didn't find an organic brain syndrome going on there. It's frightening. It is absolutely frightening. But all of it has a has a pattern. And I'll tell you, you know, the one thing I made the comment last night at, at a, I went to a meeting and I was talking to a couple of friends about this stuff. And I said and I made the point that it may turn out to be that the Southwest Airlines commercial that we see on television all the time. When the, the you know, in, in old England. <laughs> yeah. Who among you, who amongst you goes by the name Fenwick? <laughs> Tell me, exactly. and the rest of you will be spared. That's it. That is the ultimate end game of this, potentially. That commercial could be, in a very ironic way, the most frightening part of what's happening. Because I've heard people say, I have a good friend who was a Holocaust survivor who's in Pittsburgh and she was protesting during the during the inaugural and and uh, I got messages from her on Facebook and she she put on Facebook you know uh, Deutschland über alles and she said that's what he was saying yeah we got to strengthen the military and we got to basically get people to support the military and support me and my power because I can fix this. I can make it all better. And that's, she said, that's exactly what we were told in the 30s yeah. in, German, in Germany. Those connections are, are really, you know, po politically po and po potentially very, very iffy and very dangerous because people don't like to think about that. And so the media thing they say is you can't prove that, you know, there's no evidence of that. History. But if you put if you put circumstances together, you begin to you begin to get it. If you and put, if you put circumstance and behavior and vocabulary. Yes, yes. It it all comes together. And you know, you were talking about the Holocaust survivors. I spoke with Thomas Blatt years ago, um, the author of Escape from Sobibor. Mm -hmm. And uh, our oldest was doing a report and bless his heart he he agreed to speak with us and I had some wonderful conversations with him but what we're seeing is the exact same thing that happened before happening again and kind of the same type of mentality right except it's I believe and I know I'm gonna be damned for this but I think Hitler was a little bit better <laughs> than what we got now <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so yeah and and I, there there are meanings to that, and I hope no one I thinks that I am I standing up for Hitler. I know. But during his inauguration, you could see his interaction with his family. If his wife's yeah. not a domestic abuse victim, I don't know who is. Yeah, a lot of people have said that. Yeah. You can you can see it, but yeah. his family, and when a man's family isn't connected to him, what right does he have to be president? Right. I, I, you know, I mean, all of this is so important. I'm thinking, you know, there was, there was an there was an article the other day and and uh, it was actually in the Times. And the author was name was was Peter Weiner, uh, W.E.H.N.E.R. He was a Republican conservative and he, he basically would not support Donald Trump during the campaign and he won't support him now. And he gives a lot of the reasons and said nothing has changed. Nothing that has happened has changed his mind. And he said, and it's many of the things you've just said, Agnes. He said, this is what he says. The easy part, the transition to power is now over. The hard part begins now. So this concern arises. When President Trump is buffeted by events, when hard times hit, when crises arrive, when other politicians and world leaders do not bend to his will, pernicious things will happen. Rather than try to address the alienation and anger that exists in America, he will amplify them. He'll create more conspiracy theories. He'll also go in search of enemies, the press, the opposition party, other nations, even Republican leaders, in order to create diversions that inflame his most loyal supporters. 
And when he locates his targets, he'll do what is second nature to him, which is to try to delegitimize and destroy them. What's different now is that he'll have the additional awesome power of the presidency at his disposal. And that's, that is so true. So, Agnes, who among you is named Fenwick? <laughs> well, and see, the bad part of it is, is I'm the idiot that would raise my hand and go, I'm Fenwick. I'm Fenwick, yeah. Go ahead, yeah. you know, put me out of my misery, because if it'll spare them, that's fine. And, right. And that, that's looked at as a sign of weakness. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I mean, I, this, all of this is, is, is extremely concerning, and... And uh, I don't know, you know, I one of the things that came out a piece of news today that came out that really fits into this very well is that two on Sunday, two days ago, President Trump called Benjamin Netanyahu. Oh, God. Today. The announcement came out of Tel Aviv that they have approved preparations to build twenty five hundred additional homes in the West Bank. The settlements are expanding. 2,500 more homes are going to be built. Oh. And, they, and they, the article, that the, the news item that appeared said that that was announced in Tel Aviv this morning, and it came within 48 hours after Donald Trump called Benjamin Netanyahu. And the report out of Tel Aviv said, with the obviously positive turnaround in politics in America and the presidency of Donald Trump, the time is right to be, to do this. Yeah. And so this is the kind of thing that's happening. The, the China Sea on one side of the world and this kind of situation in the Middle East. And, I mean, it's obvious that the Palestinians are going to react. They, ha they have they to have react to. to this. They and have to. I mean, it's this has been a wholesale slaughter, and there's only one thing I can think of to sum it all up, is that hell's empty and all the devils are here. <laughs> oh my I'll, I'll let you I don't, get back to oh, it thank, thank you You're my my heavens that one's a tough one to respond to um it is it is thank you agnes it was it was great it was great of you to to do that and and it is frightening and i agree with you that what has been lost is the women's protest is a, is a a very powerful statement of 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 human rights and and women's rights on Saturday, has been rendered non-news. And, you know, and this, all of it, it seems to me. So the question is, what now? I mean, that seems to be the, you know, the, 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 next, the next step in this. Um, there are a couple of articles, and I, I, we'll be back on our reg at our regular time tomorrow, and I, I have a couple of other issues that I really want to deal with, but... Um, uh, we don't obviously have time left today. We got well, much less than ten minutes in our program. I think we've actually we've actually got about six minutes left in our program. So, I think we're going to have to wind up uh, today. This is a this is an incredibly important story. And the fact of the matter is, it seems almost to to, and, and I've I've said the same thing every morning or every evening that you go online or that you pick up the the newspapers, the major newspapers. The theme is the same, and it's the same person, and it has been since the campaign began, since he announced in June of last year that, that he was going to run for the presidency. This ability to manipulate and control the media, control news, the flow of news, has become critically important. A couple of the articles that I would like to address – and we'll do it tomorrow, focus on the issue of the media and more specifically about what the media can mu and must do in this kind of a situation and just as important, what it must not do. One of the articles addresses the tendency of the media to out-Trump Trump. And that's really, in the, in the mind of this particular author, the worst thing that it can do. If you believe that Trump is wrong and that you're right, then the worst thing you can do 
is to become the very thing that you think is wrong. But that's the, the, that's the inclination. That's the tendency. And the fact of the matter is he's the president of the United States. This is the White House we're talking about here. And so the power situation has reached the point where responding in the same venue, in the same way, cannot have the same outcome, obviously. If all the power is on one side and all the anger and frustration is on the other, then it's pretty obvious who's going to win unless the response is different than the circumstances that initiated the response. I think we probably need to take, you know, go into this a little bit more, a little bit in more detail. And hopefully we can do that. We can do that tomorrow. But right now we're at, we're at 56, 57 minutes after the hour. And I think, I think it's time to, uh, uh, to wind this up for, for this Tuesday, the 24th day of January. Um, I, w I want to, I don't want to, end this on a pessimistic note it's been very pessimistic uh almost as pessimistic as the inaugural uh, but you know we didn't use words like carnage and all of these other things but we kind of used words that pretty much say the same thing so i think it's an indication as to where our political discourse is taking us Remember the good old days when there was such a thing as political correctness and there were certain things that you didn't say, even if you felt them, or you wouldn't say except in private? That's one of the issues that we will be addressing in tomorrow's program as well. I want to thank everybody for tuning in today to the Virtual Center on this Tuesday, the 24th day of January. And... Uh, I especially want to thank you for your continued support of Bob Kincaid and Agnes and the folks at Head On who are making the most noble effort to kind of keep the, uh, an alternative voice on the air. It's becoming extremely difficult. It's going to become more important, clearly, because in the long term, that's the kind of thing we're talking about, is maintaining an opportunity and a forum so that those who don't agree – can speak their mind. It's important to remember that the First Amendment to the Constitution, specifically the right to free speech, in the mind of the founders, was envisioned principally as political speech. The belief was that this republic and what kinds of situations and circumstances would be necessary for this republic to function and flourish required an active informed citizenry to exchange information to share information and thereby to communicate knowledge and ultimately to provide for the citizens the knowledge and the information they would need in order to hold government accountable that's the issue that today's entire program was about. That's the issue that the news coming out of Washington is about. So in its own right, we have to appreciate the fact that it is extremely serious and extremely important. But at the same time, it's important to realize that there are other things going on. One of the things that happened this weekend was the protest. And by emphasizing and lighting flame, you know, feeding this particular fire of invective and hostility between the administration and the media, the result was successfully rendering the full impact of Saturday's protest movement over before it ever really got a chance to get started. Depending on how intentional that situation is, that move was brilliant. 
This is Bill O'Brien for the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution and Civic Responsibility. We're planning to be back tomorrow at our regular starting time, 1 p.m. in the East. I hope you have a wonderful evening. Be kind to each other. Enjoy. And hopefully we'll be back together again tomorrow. Thank you.